Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name is Tony Jordan and I'm delighted to be your host for our discussion this evening. First of all, I respectfully acknowledge that we are meeting today on the traditional land of the Kulin Nation and I pay my respects to their elders past and present and the elders from other communities who may be here tonight. So here we're talking today about this fascinating transition from adolescence to adulthood from being defined by your family or society or school or friends to finding a way to define yourself. You get a new body, you get a new perspective and an entirely different set of priorities. Um, but, so it's no wonder that readers and writers love coming of age stories. I'm very delighted to introduce to you um, three wonderful writers who have all um, been fascinated with coming of age stories and they're going to share with you a short reading from their work before we have our general discussion. On the far end, um, we're very happy to welcome um, Tegan Bennett Daylight. Tegan is a critic, teacher and fiction writer. She's the author of several books for children and teenagers, including the novels Bombora, What Falls Away and Safety. Her stories have appeared in a wide range of Australian journals, including Griffith Review, Mianjin, and Best Australian Stories. She lives in the Blue Mountains and has had to get up at five o'clock in the morning to come down and, and uh, be with us Heroine. today. Um, <laughs> can you please join with me in welcoming Tegan? And Tegan is going to read a short section from um, one of the short stories in her new collection. This which... is a short story um, called Firebugs. My collection has uh, ten short stories in it and four of them have the same characters and the two characters in those four stories are called Tasha and Judy and um, Tasha is the difficult, powerful one in the relationship and Judy is overweight and therefore doesn't have quite as much power in the relationship. So this is always from Tasha's point of view. I hated Judy's b first boyfriend as expected. He was shaped like a sweet potato. His clothes were exactly wrong. Judy had arranged for us to meet him at Circular Quay one Saturday morning so that the three of us could go to the movies. He was waiting for us when we, when we got off the ferry. He wore a T-shirt that said, I love Brisbane, loose over his narrow shoulders, clinging around his fleshy waist. He stepped forward when he saw us and produced from behind his back a bunch of yellow flowers, six or seven of them, wound in cellophane. I got out of the way so no one would think he was giving them to me. Judy and Alfred held hands as we walked up George Street. He was taller than she was, which was a mercy, and he might even have been heavier. We were early and had to sit in the dark recesses of the foyer waiting for the doors to be opened. Alfred told us about his last girlfriend who'd gone to live in America. She was stunning, he said. He had a slightly English accent and a deep, pompous voice. She had legs up to here, indicating his waist or somewhere above it. I could not meet Judy's eyes. I knew how ashamed she must be. I could picture Alfred's old girlfriend. She would be the daughter of friends of the family, stupidly tall with limp hair and glasses, someone who'd been silly enough to let Alfred kiss her during a game of murder in the dark. And now she was gone to America, too far away to correct Alfred's version of their story. I will not tell you about being in the cinema with Judy and Alfred and the sound of his mouth sipping at hers. When we came out into the light, my father had died, though the city and I didn't know that yet. It was autumn, and a cold wind blew straight up George Street, hustling a few stray people before it. We walked back down to the quay, and I was energetically mean, telling Alfred stories that Judy would not want him to hear, stories that until then had been private to both of us. When we reached the wharf, I got on the ferry before Judy did and went straight upstairs. I leant my face against the window and watched the grey water pitching all the way home, so that Judy would think it was I who had the right to be angry, and not she. My mother picked us up from the ferry, which was unusual. It was clear that she had a secret. Her lips were pinched together against the telling of it. We drove away from Judy's house, and then, instead of turning onto the main road, she pulled into the curb and parked. Tasha, she said, and I closed my eyes. I have something to tell you. I thought of asking her to keep it to herself, but she would not be stopped. My father had been at home in his study and had come out holding his head, leaning against the door frame. I have a headache, he said to his wife, Anne. Everything hurts. 
Then he fell forward onto the wine-coloured carpet and had a kind of fit, his arms and legs thrashing. He broke his wrist, smashing it against the wall. Anne called an ambulance and he was taken to hospital unconscious where he died. All this had happened while I was travelling into the city with Judy, walking up George Street, sitting in the cinema with her and Alfred. My father had been taken to the hospital closest to his house. It was 20 minutes walk from where I'd been sitting in the dark. My mother and I looked at each other. I had a moment to claim the role as chief mourner in our household. She was an o only an ex-wife and I was still a daughter, but I hesitated too long. She began to cry. I looked out of the window. Two boys from school walked past and I had to turn away so they wouldn't see me. Thanks. Thank you, Tegan. That's brand new, your collection. Yeah, when did it come out? The uh, six about weeks? two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, <laughs> yes. hot off the presses. Very, very new. Thank you. Um, our next um, presenter is uh, Tony Birch. He's the very well-known Melbourne author of Shadow Boxing, Father's Day and Blood, which was shortlisted for the Miles Franklin Literary Award and also The Promise. His new novel that he's going to give us a little taste from, Ghost River, will be released on October the 15th. Both Tony's fiction and non-fiction have been published widely in literary magazines and anthologies, both in Australia and internationally. He is currently the uh, uh, Bruce McGuinness Research Fellow within the Mundani Baluk Centre at Victoria University. Can you join me in welcoming Tony? Um, thank you. Um, this is chapter three, not all of it. <laughs> Stories of the river were told across the city there wasn't a child living within reach of the water who hadn't grown up warmed, warned away from it with tales of dead trees lurking in the darkness of the muddy riverbed, ready to snatch the leg of a boy or girl braving its filthy water. Rusting skull and crossbone signs hammered into tea, tree trunks around the old swimming holes warned of infection. There were also the horror stories of children who disappeared on sunny afternoons never to be seen again, leaving piles of clothing behind on the riverbank waiting for a parent or the police to discover the telling evidence. It wasn't only children who drowned, as well as the suicides where there were accidents. People fishing fell out of boats from time to time and went straight to the bottom, weighed down by heavy clothes and boots. A dark joke claimed that drowning was more fortunate an end, as eating fish caught from the river was a slower and more painful death. On calm days when the current moved slowly towards the bay and the sun sparkled off the water, it would have been easy to mistake the river's gentle disguise. During Sonny's first summer on the river, he decided nothing was going to stop him from going for a swim. He put the idea to Wren, who was less eager. If only half the horror stories he'd heard about the river were true, the riverbed was a graveyard he wanted to steer clear of. I don't know, Sonny, about swimming here, Wren said, sitting on the pontoon, dangling his feet in the water. I reckon you're scared. Although Sonny was right, Wren wasn't about to confess. Sonny stripped to his underpants, pumped his arms backwards and forwards as if he were an Olympic swimmer and willed himself for the challenge. It's only water, not much different than diving in at the deep end at the bars. It's nothing like the fucking bars. You can see the bottom at the bars. Here you would know your own hand in front of your face. Could be anything down there. Like what? Like stuff you can't see. You want to know what Archie calls the trees at the bottom of the river? What? When he was a kid, they called them preachers. Preachers? Yeah. If a person got caught in a snag of a dead tree and they never came back, the family would have to get a preacher to stand over an empty coffin and pray for the life and soul of the dead person. Burying an empty coffin. Fucking spooky. The image of the rotting corpse lurking below the surface was enough for Sonny to step back from the edge of the pontoon. I think old Sonny's checking out now, Wren laughed. Bullshit he is, Sonny said letting out a screech and diving into the water. Wren couldn't see any sign of him except for a trace of bubbles until he bobbed up somewhere half a halfway across the river, grinning. Wren realised he had no choice but to follow his friend into the water. He stood up, closed his eyes, crossed his heart twice and dived in. He swam to the middle of the river and flipped onto his back. As the current caressed his body, Wren noticed the shifts in water temperature from warm to ice cold. He trod water and watched Sonny as he let the current carry him down river until he reached the shallow shadow sorry, of the iron bridge and headed for the bank. 
Wren swam back to the pontoon and stood watching as Sonny circled the campsite and searched the empty humpy. He walked back along the track, jumped across to the pontoon and lay his body in the sun. Thank you, thank you. And our lucky last tonight, Liam Peeper. Liam Peeper's grandmother introduces him to her friends as my grandson who writes for the internet. <laughs> He's been published in The Monthly, Mianjin, The Best of the Lifted Brow, Going Down Swinging, and Sleeper's Almanac. Um, and he, in, he was co-recipient of the 2014 M Literary Residency. His first book is, can you lift that up? The Feel Good Hit of the Year. And um, he's going to read you a section that I've chosen by popular request. Um, uh, over to you, Liam. That's true. This section was requested. Um, so think about that while you hear it. <laughs> um, uh, th this is basically a book about, it's a memoir about growing up kind of a child of hippies and then becoming kind of a skeezy teenage dirtbag. Uh, it's about being a drug dealer, a drug addict, infidelity. Um, violence, uh, shame, uh, and me taking part in all those things, but I'm going to read you the bit that upset my grandmother. <laughs> it's about having a fun uh, sexually transmitted disease. I noticed something as I was drying myself <laughs> off after a shower. Despite my half ass spiritualist upbringing, I still have a classically Catholic relationship with my body which means that, except for the occasions when I'm masturbating and crying shamefully, I like to ignore it. When bathing, I'll give myself a once-over to check that I'm not sporting any major wounds, then quickly dress and leave the Cartesian duopoly to the experts. This time, however, I noticed there was something wrong with my penis. On its surface were tiny red sores, angry little craters, spaced out on the lunar whiteness of my manhood. With my foreskin pulled back in the chilly bathroom, Little Liam looked for all of the world like the mushroom in Super Mario Brothers that gives you an extra life. <laughs> I freaked out and reached my GP surgery in record time, my hair still wet from the shower. The GP, a true professional and one of the finest physicians I found in the kind of hot chocolate in the vending machine and knife wounds in the waiting room, bulk billing clinics that I frequented back then, saw the state I was in and ushered me through without hesitation. He donned gloves and took the offending article between thumb and forefinger and played with it briefly, <laughs> rolling it between his digits as though it were a lump of blue vein cheese from a fromagerie he did not quite trust. <laughs> ah, yes, he sighed at last. You have molluscum contagiosum. It's a localized viral infection. What? I squawked. At this point, I'd like to state that normally I take bad news with rugged stoicism, but I'd never had an STD before. And besides, the doctor was gripping my testicles rather firmly. What does that mean? I demanded. Did I catch it from sex? No, no, he laughed, which reassured me, although customarily I'm down on people laughing while they touch my junk. <laughs> this rarely presents as an infection of the genitals. Normally it affects other areas. In fact, I've never seen a man's genitals infected. It's highly infectious and spread by touch. And usually this illness affects children between the ages of one and 10 who get it on their hands. If you'd like me to talk to your partner about op treatment options, I cut him off with a polite no, and he went on to explain that the infection was easy to treat by burning off each of the 36 odd lesions with dry ice and then scraping the scars off with the blade. He worked quickly, but it was still a long, long process. At the slightest touch of scalpel or icy cotton swab, my penis contracted, shriveling into a pensive acorn. To get between the wrinkles, the doctor had to stimulate the glands until the shaft became turgid, the kind of rubbery half mast direction common to the nervous and the drunk. <laughs> a swan's neck rising gracefully from a lake. I lay back while the doctor performed his medical grade hand job. St <laughs> stopping every once in a while to hack away at me with ice and steel. To pass the time, we made small talk. <laughs> so, I asked, do you read? Not really, he said. Do you like footy? Uh, no, nah, but I don't mind soccer, though. I don't watch soccer, said the doctor. Bunch, bunch of wankers, if you ask me, he said, jerking me off. <laughs> he took a break to refresh his dry ice, which gave me the chance to thaw. I started to feel bad for myself, and for the first time, I regretted having slept around so much, having treated 
so many people badly, the way I'd lived. I'd always been quietly, loudly when drunk at parties, proud of my sexual prowess, but now, lying shriveled in the doctor's palm, my dick looked like an abandoned yum cha dish, forlorn and lost after a meal. Then, at long last, it was done. The doctor walked me out, and I shook my hand gingerly at the door. He wished me well and added, and Liam, you might want to keep it in your pants for a while. I mean, that's not my professional opinion. It's just good advice. Thank you, Liam. Well, I think, ladies and gentlemen, that's given us a very interesting place to start this discussion. Um, so I want to start with the physical, because there's an enormous transformation involved in, in coming of age as you become move from being a child to being an adult, and a lot of that is physical. Um, Tegan, there's a beautiful quote in one of your stories, does my body make sense to someone like him? How did you approach this idea of, of changing the, the changing body shape and what that does to, to a young person? Yeah, I don't think I actually approached it at all. I just sort of felt it, if you know <laughs> what I mean. Um, it's actually... The thing about a young woman's body is that when you're 12 or 13 or 14, there are some young women who blossom into sort of... They look like they're carved from crystal or they're perfect things. Mm -hmm. But for a lot of young women, including me, your body just sort of accumulates lumps for a while. <laughs> And gradually, for me, around sort of mid-twenties, it starts to take a shape that makes sense to you. So shapelessness and the lack of sense of oneself is kind of one of the things I was writing about, I guess. Uh, and in some of your stories, it's almost like the consciousness takes a while to catch up to this changing body shape. Yeah. These girls don't really realise the transformation that's, that's underway. Yeah, and they don't have any sense that they might have sexual power or anything like that. All they can think is that they're too much, too much to look at, too much to take, too noisy, too loud, too over the top, all of those sorts of things. They're not comfortable inside their skin. And I don't know that any young woman is comfortable inside her skin, and I'm, I'm going to guess that no young men are really that comfortable inside their skin either, although maybe they are. Well, he's not. <laughs> <laughs> Tony, are young men comfortable inside their skin in, in coming of, when they come of age? Um, I actually was. And it's interesting that while um, Tegan was, was talking, uh, is that I, I did, in my first book, Shadow Boxing, there's a story, um, the lesson, which is about a father giving his son a, a boxing lesson. And the quote is that the father likes fighting, the boy likes boxing, and it's very different. And when my father gave me boxing lessons, I actually loved the asceticism of it. Mm -hmm. I hated the violence of it, but I actually enjoyed it. My father was crazy, so we had to do very strict exercise regime from about the age of five. And I, I mean crazy, yeah. two hours a night, we had to run every morning. Yeah. But that muscle memory, whether I liked it then I, I, I loved it all, all my life. So when I was a teenager, actually I liked being physical in the sense of you know, j swimming, jumping from bridges into mm -hmm. the river and stuff. And as you get older, it's one of the things that I w worry about losing. And not in a sort of youthfulness of vanity, it's about get your body being able to do what you want it to do. Mm -hmm. So that's why I still run, I, I still ride a push bike. So I actually felt that when I say I liked my body, I was quite comfortable and I enjoyed doing things with it, mm -hmm. which could be a bit self-destructive at times, but uh, most of the kids that I hung out with, that's what we did. We sort of came up with different physical tests that would would see if you can live. There is a lot about that in your stories and there's a lot about like that jumping into water. There's uh, yeah. toe cutters, is it? Yeah. Another one of your short stories where boys kind of push themselves and test themselves. Yeah. It, it, the body is really about what it can be good for, what, what it can be used for. Yeah, we had, and Tegan said it's a nightmare for her, but we had a school reunion recently which I actually enjoyed and it was amazing the number of people who rem who knew the heights of all the bridges we jumped from across really? the Yarra. Still remember. And the highest bridge is Skipping Girl Bridge at Victoria Street, and it's about 68 feet. And wow. Yeah, we would jump from that. And, and the boys were saying the other night that I jumped from that bridge, which is in the new book, and I looked down at the wrong time, and the water shot up my nose and, <laughs> <laughs> and gave me two black eyes. But. Mm. Gee. And you see that as part of coming of age, part of finding well, your strength and finding I mean, I, I was just going to say I don't want to be romantic, but I am being romantic because the negative side of that is that 
I reckon it seems, and it's interesting Tegan says age. I, my golden year was when I was 15. Right. I'd never mm -hmm. taken any drugs or alcohol. I, it was like a, it's both a, a year of innocence and discovery, and then after that it went to shit because you know the 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 enjoyment became really self-destructive. You have friends who did die not because of jumping off bridges, mm -hmm. of driving cars, of fighting, of too much alcohol, drug overdoses. So it's like the last year where you could do things which were were pushing the envelope, but mm -hmm. within a margin of safety, and then after that. For a lot of kids, it, it became a real negative because wow. it goes to another level yeah, right. and you lose control of that very quickly. Yeah, right. Thank you. It sounds, if, if I might please, say please. something, it sounds a little bit as though Tony led with the body, if yeah. you know what I mean, which yeah. seems really healthy to me and good, whereas the body was way back yeah, for, you. <laughs> for me, way, Catching way back, up. buttoned into things, yeah. covered in And I mean, I've got four daughters. And and that thing, when each of my daughters, I'm very close to my daughters, but when, when they reach, going through the beginnings of puberty, they withdrew. And I, I really lamented, but knew it by the second one, that they didn't want you to hug them right, anymore. Right, right. But then after, when they're about 16 or 17, you get them back. They come out of that. Yeah, so yeah, there's that real period of awkwardness. Thank you. Um, Liam, as well as that interesting passage you read us. There's the physicality in your memoir, which is, you know, a, a, a non-fiction. Um, it's almost like you're trying on different bodies. Like there was a time when you went through a great deal of exercise and kind of got a, a, a degree of physical prowess and, there, and then that kind of went away and that kind of came up again. How, how, does, it, how does the physical work for you in, in your coming of age story? Huh. Um, I suppose... Uh I came of age, uh, um, the book is about addiction, to give, without giving away the ending, I get off the drugs eventually. Um, I guess that would be the coming of age and part of that is involved with um, just kind of my body gave up, mm -hmm. you know. Mm. There's, the great thing about being an adolescent male is that you are invincible and nothing can ever hurt you. And so bullets just, the bullets bounce right off. and. I don't know, I suppose I was, a, I was pr very much the opposite of Tony. I was a profoundly uncoordinated child. Um, and I never really, I never played sports very well. Uh, I spent all my time lost in, in books and imagination and that kind of thing because uh, if I went outside and tried to play soccer with the other boys, I would just get beat the heck up. Uh, and so later on when I did grow, uh, a little fitter. I, I, I took out martial arts, and I, I, when I was a boy, I thought that that was what being a man was, was being able to kick someone's ass. Um, of course, th that's the opposite mm -hmm. of what it is. Um, so, But I you kind of took up martial arts as, as a tool for your growing business as well, didn't you? Yes, because, well, uh, you can't see it from where I'm sitting, but I'm about four foot. <laughs> and uh, I was kind of... I was like a na friendly neighborhood drug dealer, but some of the other neighborhood drug dealers weren't so friendly. And so I, would t I took up kind of fighting as a, I don't know, kind of like as a crucifix that I could, I could hold to, to be braver, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, I was never very good at fighting, but once you get beat up a couple of times, you realize it's not that bad. And s that offers a degree of, of solace to the young budding gangster who's not physically uh, appropriate <laughs> for the role. Well, there you go, Tony. Getting beaten up is not that bad, says Liam. Um, you, you have a kind of a different view of, of violence in some of your books. And there's another, a lovely quote in that section um, of your new book. Having conquered it, they moved on to others. This is talking about jumping off the bridges. Testing their bravery, each bridge higher and more dangerous than the last. Mm. So it's not just the physical nature of it, it's bravery, it's the pushing of it. I is bravery an important component of adolescence to you? Well, for, for these boys, it certainly is. But I, I, I think relating it to Liam's point, it is interesting. It is still about, I mean, I, it might sound scary, but it might sound odd as well, but... Yeah, I think basically the sorts of things we did, we did in relative safety. I mean, you could hurt yourself jumping from 50 feet, but if you did something stupid, so... Um, 
it, it's more, I think, the point that the bravery was still controlled. Mm -hmm. And I think Liam's point's really important about fear because fear, in fact, I was a very good fighter and with no boasts because my father was an extremely violent man, a, a psychopathic man who, who really lived through tutoring his sons to be violent. Mm -hmm. So I was very good at fighting and I never lost the fight. But the fact was there was nothing that filled me with more disgust in the end and fear of myself. So I, wasn't, I didn't fear other boys, I feared that I would become like my father. Mm -hmm. So when I put that in, in a way to me these boys are quite sweet in a way. Mm -hmm. That um, they do test themselves but yeah they don't want to harm other kids yeah. and, and they love these old men who they know from the river. So th to me that's still about an innocence. All right, you might do something a bit crazy and I wouldn't, you have my... 14 year old son or daughter was doing that, I'd be a bit worried as a parent, but n much less worried than if they were out committing acts of violence. So I, I think it's, it's yeah, we're, and Liam just said about what it is to be a man, is that um, it might sound odd to say this, but until I was 10 years old, I didn't differentiate that I was a boy or a girl in an overt sense, mm -hmm. and I actually wasn't sure that I was gonna grow up. And when my mum said to me one day, I, my brother had started high school and I said, I said, I'm sick of walking up and meeting Brian after school. He said, well, you better get used to it, you're doing it next year. And I said, what do you mean I'm doing it? She said, you're going to high school and then you'll do this and then you'll grow up and be a man. And when she said, you'll grow up and be a man, I just said, well, I'll grow up like my dad. It was a horrific right. thought. The scarier thing. That's, yeah. So they're the really scary things. And yeah, we, we're having five children, you know, the, the thing that I've, I suppose, focused on is is to, you know is about love mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. that you know for men in particular to be physical with your children in a different way so i understand what liam's talking about because that's the the worst sense that you can not only be hurt but you can hurt other people liam some of the situations you put yourself in in your memoir absolutely terrified me when i was reading them apart from the page one yeah. one from before <laughs> lots of them i mean w did you have a, a sense of your courage kind of growing with it mm. or was it just so second nature that you didn't i mean courage is overcoming fear you didn't feel the fear therefore it wasn't courage quite the opposite uh to courage it was luckily i was high and drunk for a decade so pretty much every decision i made from about 14 to about 26 was facilitated by a varying degree of drugs or alcohol. And so I, I really didn't think anything I was doing through, which sounds foolish, but it's really quite a comforting thing after a while because you learn how to live your life like a, like a, a pinball, mm -hmm. just kind of ricocheting from situation to situation and you learn that you can improvise and that you'll survive no matter what happens mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, at least for a while so that if there were ever scary situations uh, I really didn't register it till later on and by then it had become a funny story it's actually kind of a really dangerous pathology now that I examine it um, and it, at least I got a book out of it. I, I have that terrible <laughs> tick that m I think many writers do where they'll justify doing something a bit daft because maybe there's a story mm -hmm. in it. Mm -hmm. I've always got that. Even now that I've kind of ostensibly grown up a little, I have this little devil on my shoulder that's like, it'll be very funny if you do that. There's awful one thing. scene where your old martial arts teacher, your sensei, mm -hmm. like, drags you out of a car by the window and like yeah <laughs> that's horrifying yeah I, that that was confronting <laughs> I, I um yeah that's kind of that's one of the i guess the coming of age touchstones in the book when i realize i'm not actually very good at fighting and i'm <laughs> probably going to get myself uh brutalized and mangled and head butted into a salty marmalade if I continue hanging around with these people. Um, so yeah, that stuff was scary, but at the same time, when you're, well, when I was young, I had a very poorly conceived sense of my own mortality. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, learning how to, how to fear everything is, is actually quite useful at a certain 
stage of growing yeah, up. Yeah, right. I, I think. suppose it is. It's part of growing up to learn what you should fear and that you're not invincible and what you shouldn't. Yeah, I still, yeah, I still uh, wouldn't win a fight against it. Is, sen is Sensei here tonight by any chance? No? Good. He, he was a scary man. Tegan, Tasha is quite self-destructive. At times? Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, although th it's not so much physically, is it? I was thinking about the idea of courage that you were talking about and comparing my experience or small, very, very minor experience of courage with these guys. Courage when uh, I was growing up in a sort of leafy uh, part of Sydney was really just standing up for someone or calling someone out for being homophobic or racist. Mm -hmm or telling a boy that you didn't want to go out with him, or right. harder still, telling a boy that you did want to go out with him. Right. <laughs> right. That was the sort of limit of, of my, the, the, my need to express courage in my life, and it wasn't expressed that much. Um, what was, sorry, I, this, <laughs> what was the I, other I thing? Just I was just interested, I got involved in these no, guys talking good. about courage. Yeah. I just wanted to, uh, Tasha can be um, quite, I thought self-destructive at times, like she kind of sabotages herself, and uh, yeah, she's got she's got kind of a thing going on where she really yeah. wants to test the people around her, I suppose, to see whether they love her or whether they really care for her. It's not on purpose, though. She's just unable not to say the things that she shouldn't say. So when you're a teenager, my experience of being a teenager was that the most important thing was not to appear to seem to appear to want things. So you shouldn't want food or sex. Because it's not cool, does that because mean? Because it's not to, cool. Because yeah. to show mm. desire means to let go of yourself a little right, bit. Right, right. So why yeah. I love Tasha so much is that she just cannot stop herself. Yeah, right. So when she asks the cutest boy in year 10 if he'll go out with her and he says, um, I don't think we've got anything in common mm. and everyone thinks you're a lesbian, mm -hmm. <laughs> She just wants to die and she wishes that she hadn't, but she literally can't stop herself. So mm. you don't define that as courage either because she literally Not so much can't courage stop as herself. just um, an inability to self-censor, mm -hmm. which is why I like her so much, yeah. you know, because I actually did a lot of self-censoring myself. I didn't ever ask the cutest boy in year 10, you know. So, so if you extrapolate her through these difficult years, um, what... what it, these things that, that you know, were a disadvantage when she was dealing with them in teenage years, maybe she becomes a, somebody fantastic when she grows up. Well, she, she continues to say difficult things and she continues to be a kind of a difficult person. But the best thing about her is that she's self-aware, at mm -hmm. least. She knows mm -hmm. who she is. And there's nothing like finding out who you are when you're standing at a party and people are laughing at you mm. because you've just asked a boy yeah. if he'll be your boyfriend. Yeah. See, I, I think that is much more courageous. Yeah. And again, I, I know it more from my daughters where I've seen my daughters go through real agony of being marginalised or having difficulties. And, you know, my youngest daughter, who's a great kid, has recently had a couple of issues. And I said, well, you know, you're going to have to stand up. And she has. And I, seriously, I think that is much more courageous than mm -hmm. jumping off a bridge. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, Isn't it interesting yeah. what a different kind of courage it is? Because, mm. I, I mean, physical stuff, I've run across six lanes of, of a road, pissed. <laughs> because That's scary. I'm glad you did how sober, reckless actually. with booze. And how old and were And I've you? jumped off bridges mm. how old in my that? late teens, early yep. teens, late yep. teens. We had a bridge near our house that we did. Six lanes, of, we're yeah. talking. Yeah. Six, six lanes. Drunk enough children. not to think about it. Yeah. Cars screeching to a halt. And Lucky my mother is dead because she would not like to hear the story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and <laughs> that having to face. think about it is the issue. Well, it's interesting, I, when I visit schools, I say to kids, I used to run this line, which I believed, because I'd been expelled from two high schools in Melbourne. I'd been in a lot of trouble, but then I went back to university. And people say, oh, what you did is amazing to go back and etc. And I thought, yeah, that's, yeah. I, and interviewers would suggest it. When we went to a gathering of our old school friends, about 12 of us three years ago, I remember this girl, and I'll say her name, she's a great woman, Jenny Heald, who I always thought was a square head in a, you know, at school, and uh, she lived in the commission flats. She was sitting next to each other. She did year 12, went on and did law. Her mother died when she was 15. I didn't know. For the last three years of high school, she actually basically went to school every day, mm -hmm. looked after her little brother, got herself through school, went to university, 
you know, made sure he was okay. And I would never run that line again that I, what I did was so amazing mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. to stay and do the hard work is much more courageous than saying, oh, I'm good at it, I'm, an, I'm a failure. Mm -hmm. And you sort of wear that as a badge. Yeah. You know, dropping out is actually a cop out in some ways and it's much easier. And a lot of the people that I sat around that table, I would say again, were, were much more courageous for sticking when it was hard than just me wagging school and smoking cigarettes at the river. So, so do these experiences in these formative years, if we kind of spread them a bit wider and, and say they're like Liam's lost, you know, 14 to 26 years, is that what shapes the rest of your life? Is it that important? Is it a foundation stone for how things go? Well, for me, it, again, why I have strangely have enjoyed the school reunion experience is that those formative years for me, which are combined of going to Richmond High School, hanging around the river and living on a housing commission estate, they're the p group of people I still have a connection with. And it was a period of my life where, where I think you articulated, the for me, the best side of myself mm -hmm. and also the best side in other people. So it's not, I know we're doing popular nostalgia, but I've been really struck of how deep my emotional connection is with people who knew me and I knew during those years. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's different, I think, age time than Liam, and I'm not sure now that you've introduced getting pissed and running across the highway. <laughs> My period after that of being, yeah, drinking too much and getting into fights is nothing to be either nostalgic about or to mm -hmm. reminisce about. So that sort of stuff I've never written about because I actually feel it was a ter terrible period in my life. Mm -hmm. So that period just before then of what you might call youthful innocence, it's actually quite real for me. It's not just romantic. It was a great time. Liam, do you feel nostalgic for that lost 12 years? Like the things that were going on there and the people that you knew and... Do you need to be able to remember <laughs> to, to feel nostalgia? <laughs> um, you know, at times I... You know, it was a childhood of sorts. And I, you know, of course I miss the people who I grew up with and we had fun and we taught each other all those little things from life. I was, what we were discussing earlier about the hardest thing to do is, is tell the cute boy that you like him. Now that I was thinking about it, I was comparing in my head that time I got beat up by the Kung Fu master. <laughs> and when I tried to tell, tried to kiss my best friend at uh, the year 11 dance, mm -hmm. And that was definitely far. It's scary. Yeah, and I walked away limping a lot harder from that one. <laughs> but um, the question was about nostalgia. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, I it's everything is rose tinted when you look back, and it was childhood, and I had fun. I find it very hard sometimes to relate to to people um, who. Like, I'll tell them a funny story from my... Ch I was at a party the other day and I was talking to a woman, a social worker by trade, and I was telling her a hilarious story about, uh, like, about the first date I ever went on. And I finish and I wait for, like, the applause and uh, the laughter after the punchline. And she just kind of, like, like strokes my shoulder sympathetically and gives me a business card. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> call me, because I can refer you to someone who can help. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it, it is it is kind of hard to to relate. When I was young, I had a huge chip on my shoulder about it. Like I, I would I would like meet, particularly when I went to university, and I was surrounded by people who'd had comparatively sheltered lives, mm -hmm. and I would I, I desperately wanted to tell everyone how unhappy I was, and they wanted to do the same because we were, you know, in our early twenties, and that's what you do if you come from my school of dating, which is listen to Jeff Buckley and cry. <laughs> Um, you know, so I'd want to be like, you know, oh, I'm a drug addict, my, I've lost family to heroin, everything is awful. You know, but your parents got divorced when you were 16, that must have been pretty hard, Cassandra. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, so I was, yeah, I was kind of a jerk about it, actually. None of this answers your question. <laughs> no, but it's all very interesting. Um, and Tegan, there's a fondness that you have in, in six bedrooms. I think there's a really bittersweet character about the way you look back on those years. I think you, you are quite nostalgic for them. Not at all. Not uh. at all. Anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> so glad it's gone. But um, I have, after writing the stories, I did 
start to understand that the thing that I, I don't like to think about my teenage years is, is that they were spent uh, pretending to be someone else, trying to be someone else. So I'm not happy with them. I, don't, I look mm. back at them and they seem just laced with lies to me. But the thing that was when I was most myself was when I was on my own. And recently, through writing the stories and thinking about it a lot, I've come to realise that you're never so alive as you are when you're a teenager. You never feel so vividly again. You never experience... Uh, I've written a little bit in the book about having daydreamed so intense that I didn't notice the way home. On my way home from school, I used to daydream so intensely. I had a brief, embarrassing period where I was obsessed with Bruce Springsteen. Nothing embarrassing about that. Thank you, Tony. It's very kind of you, very kind of you. And everybody else was, you know, listening to New Order. I was into Bruce Springsteen. And I'll confess that I had a fantasy in Hunters Hill, which is a North Shore suburb of Sydney, and it's a dead end. You can't actually get anywhere. You get down to the edge of the harbour and you can't go further. But I had this idea that somehow, after he'd done his show at the entertainment centre, his driver would drive him down. And I would be walking home from school, so, you know, my timing was all out of whack as well. <laughs> and he would, you know, open the door. And, of course, I didn't know what would happen next because I was only 15 and he was 50 or something <laughs> like that. But that was very rich, that kind of daydreaming for me. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just a joke. It was, it was so rich that I could barely talk about it. And that's what I'm nostalgic for. The times when music could change the architecture mm. of your brain, you know, mm. the, the way that when you remember a song from that time, even mm. if it's a song that you don't like, you're jerked back to this yes, sort of yes. amazingly vivid amount, huge feeling. And the relationships I had with blokes back then that were, they weren't only platonic, they didn't actually exist, <laughs> were very rich, <laughs> very, very, very rich and very alive. And is that why you've chosen it? Is that why you, this is the time in, that you've been so interested in? I didn't, I didn't really cho choose it, it just chose me, you mm -hmm. know, I sort of couldn't stop myself from writing about it. Actually, Tony and I were asked to write stories at the same time mm. for a collection by um, my friend Charlotte Wood. Yeah. And um, that was what started me writing this, right. writing this book. In fact, the very first short story I wrote properly was for Charlotte's book about a girl in London. Wow. Mm. Mm. And that thing of you know, the Springsteen fancy, although I had that, he was actually coming to Collingwood. But um, <laughs> um, that thing again with my daughters, when my da one of my daughters, that Taylor Swift song, 15, yep. there was a time before earphones, she was just playing it really loud in her bedroom. And I, what part of me wanted to say, turn it off, I've had enough of it. And then part of me, I know exactly why yep. she's doing this and just let it go. Because yep, yep, at yep. that moment, what that song did for her, and she might be embarrassed by the song now, I don't know, was so intense and important to her that you think, let her go because yeah. it's so rich. It's this so is not so going to happen again. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. It doesn't right. happen when you're 58, yep. yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, very soon we're going to stop for your questions. So if you can, comp I'm sure there's lots, so if you can compose them in your head now. Um, meanwhile, I just want to ask our panel one more question, but first I'll confess that while Tegan was interested in Bruce Springsteen, I was um, a Duran Durani. So I don't think he can get any worse than that. So just let me put that on the table. <laughs> I was going to marry Simon Le Bon and um, live in a foreign country. So there it's you go. It's very sad. Yeah, it's sad. On your yacht. <laughs> <laughs> um, why do you think we love reading, Tegan? Why, why do we think we love reading coming of age stories so much? Why are they perennially popular? I guess because the best kind of books are about people in a process of change. You want something to happen in your books. So. I think that's one of the reasons, and I think the other reason is because we actually do all retain that very vivid sense mm -hmm. of coming of age. And I was thinking about, because we were chatting about it before, and I was thinking about coming of age stories, and obviously the one that's in the news at the moment is To Kill a Mockingbird. It's such an important book, and it's an important book for us as well, and it's a really important book to Tony. It, it provides such an interesting thread through mm. blood. Um, but my favourite coming-of-age book, if I may leap ahead Please. slightly, is a really little-known book by um, Rudyard Kipling called Storky and Co. It was published in 1899. Storky and what, sorry? Storky and Co, as in Storky and, and Company. Oh, yeah. okay, yep. And it's about Rudyard Kipling's days at uh, a private, or what they call a public boys' school. 
like Sandhurst, it was a school for training young men for the army in the late 19th century, absolutely brutal. And I think one of the lines in the book is, the life of a young poet at a big school is hard. And uh, it's an absolutely magnificent little red book by Kipling. Thank you. Um, Tony, what about you? Why do you think they're so popular and what are your favourites? Why they're so popular? It's interesting because um, there's an American writer who unfortunately died last year, Kent Roof. And I can't remember the title of his most recent book. He finished it before he died and I read it on the plane coming back from London. When you read books on the plane, you don't remember anything in the book except <laughs> to say one of the things that struck me and it's the idea I've got for my next book is that I think that clearly in early adulthood there's a period of which you, you, you're quite attached to that period and you're, you're fond of it and there might be a bit of a sort of disowning of it in a period in your life. I actually am pretty convinced now that the that feeling of, that you have in youth and that yearning for that and the nostalgia, you actually revisit it when you, when you get older. Okay. And for me now, it's not like a sadness or a nostalgia for myself. I think old age and youth, there's something quite that goes together with them, which came out in the, in the, the Haruf book. My favourite, and it's not sort of classic coming of age, but the um, Norwegian writer Per Peterson, who's my favourite writer in the whole right. world. Really? Um, How interesting. He, all of his books, there is that reflection on youth, which, again, I think what he does, his books, even though you might, they have a coming of age element, they are generational because those coming of age stories are clearly linked to middle age and old age yep. and the sense of both regret but rediscovery. So for anyone here who's older, it's, we, it'll come back. We go the, I think right. we, we'll end up going the full circle. Full circle. So while well, I think we all agree that there's that period in your life you can never quite capture that mm -hmm. youth again, I reckon there's a great opportunity to be really naughty in old age and, <laughs> you know, take drugs again, sleep around. There's a lot more you know, bridges in your yeah. future, isn't I there? I think if you get to 70 or something, you think, well, that's, I've got this far. I'm going to hit, hit the turps yeah. again. <laughs> Why yeah. not? So start being really promiscuous, I Fantastic. would suggest. <laughs> what about you, Liam? What, uh, why do you think coming of age stories are popular and what, what ones do you like? I will answer that question. But first, some trivia. Do you know, speaking of becoming promiscuous in later age, <laughs> I was, I've got a friend who works in, in nursing in aged care and apparently a lot of pe people, you know, uh, when they move into assisted living, get a second, third wind. Mm. And apparently a, a syphilis is a huge problem now <laughs> in a lot of elder, elder living facilities. So that's something to look forward to. Go what? for it. <laughs> I was going to say use protection. I forgot that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you, you'll be a little past, uh, you know, breathing age, so it would be fine to just mm -hmm. kind of let it all hang out, I suppose. Mm -hmm. You know, you wouldn't really <laughs> need to bother. Anyway, nostalgia. Yeah, well, wha <laughs> um, why do you think coming-of-age stories are so popular and what do you like? Well, it depends uh, really on what side of the thing you are. Um, uh, to take the example of To Kill a Mockingbird, I mean, when you're young and you study it, it's a wonderful story. Uh, it's a wonderful moral lesson couched in a great narrative and of course that's how that's why we tell ourselves stories we tell ourselves stories to uh, make sense of the world and to to kind of buttress more intangible things within a narrative structure because you know life doesn't have neat uh, first second and third acts human beings uh, the human soul is a great unwieldy volvo of a thing it takes a long time to turn uh, but you don't remember the, graduate, the gradations of learning and growing up. You mm -hmm. remember big events, mm -hmm. and that's what mm -hmm. attracts us to these stories when we're young, because we read them as a, um, a blueprint or a diagram or a map of how we might navigate the challenges we're about to go through. Conversely, on the other side of that, when we're old, we can reread those stories or read them for the first time and see them as, um, as valuable building blocks of ourselves. Mm -hmm. I don't much care for morals, though. <laughs> and my favourite coming of age stories aren't actually really coming of age, but they're, there's two writers in particular, David Sedaris and this guy, uh, David Rakoff, who sadly passed away of cancer a couple of years ago, who's mm -hmm. like a better version of David Sedaris. Um, and he would, he would write these, these essays that uh, kind of deal with coming of age of perpetual adolescence, which is kind of where I come through life, I'm yet to really grow up, I think. And he was maybe 40 when he passed away and he still was kind of a petulant teenager. And I admire that 
and I look up to being that one day. <laughs> and so his, his stories are all kind of mm. about growing and about a piece at a time building a, a wall of respectability and uh, tranquility about your life. I can, yeah, uh, David Rakoff. Really Recommended. Good. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, have you got any questions from, for our panel about writing, writing coming-of-age stories or writing memoir or um, what people will get up to when they get older? Is there anything you'd like to ask? There's one more. Yep, thank you. Hello. Hi. Um, thank you. Um, I really enjoyed the, um, the talk. Um, I think that at points um, it came up this idea that um, adolescence is a time to look back to and be nostalgic about, etc. Um, do you think that there's a limit um, on when people can come of age? Do you think that it can happen later in life and maybe that's why some of us like to read the stories or yes, write them. Some of us, as Liam said, have very delayed adolescence. Thank you. When, when is the, the coming of age story? When do people come of age these days, Tony? Well, it's interesting because in Blood, I mean, I, I, when I wrote the, the character Jesse, he's only 13 years of age, but I, d I felt that I wanted to write a character who was all, already world weary. Yeah. So that yeah. just to address the question, one of the things I think about coming of age is possibly about when you might in some ways separate from a parent in the sense of not physically but find some emotional independence. And for a boy like Jesse who has lost all faith and belief in his mother, he had to go through that period where he just doesn't believe in her anymore. And that's quite early because I think most children have at some stage in their life quite a blind faith in a parent and parents who transgress and treat their children badly, as my father used to say, look, it won't happen again. Mm -hmm. Even though you'd heard that many times before, you actually believe it, mm -hmm. you truly believe it and then it would happen again, you'd be shocked. So I think part of it is about the maturity of a, of a, of a, of a, a child or a teenager. But again, I think it, you know, Liam, you know, when I, I don't mean this in a negative way, sort of the humour around, you know, put, maybe not growing up until you're 40. I think that's a really important question because while you, you know, I have five children, I have to work and be a responsible adult, there is a side of me that my children, my oldest daughter who's in her 30s, she's probably my best friend and she likes it that I'm not sort of juvenile but I'm nor am I sort of an old man who's a grumpy sort mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. grandfather to be that I, I would hope that what's changed in gener generations sort of in the post-war era into the 21st century is that you can actually, you don't have to, you can wear the same clothes as your kids, which you couldn't do. <laughs> yeah. um, so that I actually think that it's, that parts of you grow up and parts of you don't. And I think if parts of you don't grow up, that's probably a really good thing. Yeah, great. Tegan, when do you grow up? Well, it's different for everybody, surely. For me, it was just having children made me grow up. It was a completely different experience of myself. And uh, it wasn't really the sense of responsibility. It was more the sense of suddenly you have this very steep perspective from which to look at your own life. So having your own kids, I'm sure plenty of you have got kids, my experience has been that you get to re-experience your childhood, but just from a more sort of measured, sometimes measured, point of view so for me that's really the moment of maturing but w everybody matures at a different pace and not everybody has kids so I'm sure it's different for everyone. Liam there's a lovely line toward the end of your book it might be time I grew up a bit and I quite like the a bit um, are you grown are you a grown up as you sit there discussing your memoir? Uh, my, me my editors made me put that in. <laughs> I, had, I had no intention of ever becoming a real boy. Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm better than I was. I'm more grown up than I was, uh, even than when I wrote that. Um, you know, I, I had a certain amount of childlike naivety about me when I wrote it, which I'm glad of because it means the book was more honest than it should have been, uh, you know. It, it, I kind of wrote a stupidly honest book about being 
a drug dealer. The one after that, incidentally, is about how my life fell apart after I wrote a book about being a drug dealer. <laughs> uh, it's called Mistakes Were Made. Um, sorry, Tony? No, 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 sorry. Oh, yeah, so yeah, I mean, we're all, we're all slowly growing. I think that I've, you know, I'm slowly, there's a lot of lessons that I missed out on, which I think anyone who struggles with drug and alcohol abuse, you just kind of skip. Uh, you learn how to live a basic, like what looks like a basic facade of a life, but you miss out on little things. So I'm constantly learning little things, like how to use silverware. Or the other day I learned why you tuck the bed in, like, because when it's cold, I thought people were just being crazy. Like that you would get out of bed and then make the bed and then move on in life. But it has a functional purpose. Who knew? The, anyway, to answer your question, <laughs> little by little, slowly. Little by little. Still I mean, not taller. There is another, I mean, Lynn's raising another important point. It's yep. also what bits of you. Yeah. Because uh, quite seriously, I could survive like Jesse when I was 13 on the street. And, yep, yep. yeah, I'd worked in abattoirs and had really she judged when I was 14, 15. Could have, could have looked after myself. Mm -hmm. But what I couldn't do was accept responsibility because my father was a man who'd say, if you, as long as you tell me the truth, you, uh, you won't get hit. And I would tell him, then he would just belch you senseless. So what you learn is to never tell the truth. Mm -hmm. Or your parents would say, if the police ever ask you a question, whatever the question is, you do not tell them the answer because, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah, police were an enemy. But as an adult and a parent, what you might think one of your kids would do, if, if I dropped a cup in the kitchen, I dropped the cup, the first thing that would come out of my mouth, I didn't, oh, it's not me. Yeah, right. I didn't do it. Yeah, yeah. And my wife was always puzzled. Why would you always deny these yeah. things? And clearly it's because I thought it's someone's going to really hurt me. Patterns, yeah. So it probably took me until at least into my... I reckon probably my early 50s probably could fully accept if I've done something wrong, mm -hmm. I can say I've done it wrong, I can accept responsibility and no one's going to whack me. So that part of you, you know, is a really delayed maturity based on really sound reasons, but it can really infect decades of your adult life. Wow. Mm. Thank you. We might have time for one more quick question. Is there anybody else? There is. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Um, I was just wondering about narrative voice and if you're writing a, a coming-of-age uh, novel, whether what it's a, uh, a, a big a consideration, whether you have to suppress your, your adult voice and try and reimagine how Find you thought. Find your inner child. What do you think, Tegan? Oh, it's just such a good question. I just want to pause for a moment and bask. <laughs> <laughs> applause as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you don't when you well uh, i'm pretty sure these guys would feel the same you don't sit down and go the way you say oh, i'll paint in blue today i'll choose this narrative voice it chooses you if you're writing at your best um i've found that the first person works best for these kinds of stories i found that writing from a distance works best for these kind of stories alice munro used to say i need to be five years at least away from the material I think uh, that's a pretty good gauge mm. for me about finding mm -hmm. a voice to tell a story. Um, it's taken me it's taken me years and years and years to find the right voice to tell the stories that I wanted to tell in this book because previously to that, they've all been either very very controlled or very very self pitying, and so for me, finding the right voice was about finding a character who actually did things rather than just stood around going, oh, this is terrible look how harmful this life is or look how terrible these people are, to actually find a character who set out to do stupid things and did a number of stupid things and therefore made the story move, that was a huge discovery of voice for me. I hope that's a decent answer to a great question. Yeah, and it's interesting because I have had two very opposite um, experiences. I mean, not opposite to Tegan's opposite in myself, is that when I wrote Blood, the, the narrative voice, I wanted to write first person and I really had this sense at some point that when I was writing and, and I, I got Jesse's voice as close to pitch yep. perfect as I could. I was, I was happy with it and thought, no, this is now the voice that I want and I could proceed. But because you're writing first person, it's, I think it's more intimate, even though you put that distance that Tegan just talked about, there's an intimacy for the reader. But there's also, I suppose, what you know, a limited first person perspective. 
the new book, Ghost River, which is about two boys about the same age as Jesse, I wrote the whole manuscript in first person from Ren's perspective. And I thought, I've finished it, I'm happy with it, the structure's right. I went to bed one night and I'm thinking, there's something, there's something going on, there's something I'm not quite happy with and I don't know what it is. And I woke up at four o'clock in the morning, that morning, and said, I've got to rewrite this whole manuscript oh, in third Jesus. person, Ooh. which I rang the publisher the next day and told them. And then I, I wrote one chapter in third person and knew it was exactly what I needed to do. Yeah. And it, you can but feel that movement yeah, when you and, get the, the and I right. suppose the point to answer your question is that while I lost the narrative voice of the first person, it, it enabled me to, in, in a way, bring in the ensemble of other voices that, that made it, for this book, a much better outcome. So if I was teaching a writing class, I would say I agree entirely with Tegan, but it, it's also for each character, each story, it's horses for courses. And, and if anyone here is a writing student or a writer, if you've got any doubt, I always say to my students, nothing's lost from taking just the first page of the manuscript or the story, right? If it's in first, try third person, read it out aloud, get a sense of what's won and what's lost, and, and it'll help you make a decision. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, we could keep going all night on this fascinating topic, but we are out of time now. I'd like to thank you for joining us, and I'd like you to join me in thanking our guests. Thank you.